And here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Life Edge, because life uh, just shouldn't be mediocre. And today, we're not going to be mediocre. I am Rick Zanotti, and I'm joined by my good friend and co-host, Dr. Susan Ash. Hey, Susan, how are you? It's a windy day, and I'm really looking forward to the second half of what we were talking about with um, our great friend, Ed Stewart. That, that sounds great. His Highness, he's with us again today. Oh, yeah. It is Dr. Ed Stewart coming to us from just outside Chicago, or actually in Chicago. And uh, in the studio, we've got the Harold, Harold Muliati. He's our video producer. And here we go. This show is sponsored by Relay Corporation. Digital learning development, media development, corporate video, management consulting, and more. Visit us at www.relate.com. Thanks. And we are back and in that center position of power, as we call it. It's His Highness. It's Dr. Ed Stewart. How are you doing today, Ed? Great. It's Actually, Susan said it's windy where she is. It's windy here in Chicago, but... Fortunately, Imagine I that. fixed my hair for the for the broadcast, and so ready to go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I like that. Yeah, you know we're we're having really weird weather in Southern California. It, it's it's not quite as bad as let's say Denver, where you don't know what it's going to be from hour to hour. But mm-hmm. the other day we're two percent humidity. Then we're now eighty percent humidity. We, we've got fifty mile an hour gusts of wind. Then it's completely dead. This is all in the span of about four or five days. It's yeah. strange weather. It's weird. Uh-huh. I keep going. I hope we don't have an earthquake, but you know everybody calls this <laughs> earthquake weather because you don't know what's ca- oh. what's coming. So it's oh, interesting. Wow. We will see. Well, pre pre show we were all talking about heading to Vienna, Austria. So we're we're ready. I think we should all buy tickets and head over there. It sounds absolutely gorgeous. It is. So. Good food, good music, good architecture. Interesting. Are the people pretty um, friendly? History. Yeah, very friendly. Yeah. Very very friendly. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, Ed, it's a strange world we live in. There's so much news and so much stuff going on. I know you and Susan were talking about China and the five-year plan. Is that is that what we're talking mm-hmm. about today? Yes, yes. And uh, Susan had made several um, key points about a kind of a redirection of the Chinese economy. Hmm. And we had kind of started talking about all the ramifications of of that so um. that's right yeah I mean I think the first thing you don't know if some of these um, elements of the five-year plan are kind of reactive to um, trade uh-huh. war persistence or if, or if they're just truly part of the larger 30-year plan but at, at any rate I mean the thing is I'm curious to see what you have to say first of all step one the idea that's kind of made in China uh, in in buying and, and growing with consumer society, consumer culture, and buying local, buying locally produced things and trying to eliminate a lot of imports, but at the same time trying to boost exports to other countries. Um, and, and it just seems like that seems like classic import substitution to me, which ends up in a case of, of China basically killing off the people they want to export to because a lot of the companies are like Starbucks that they they count on the Chinese market for their survival. So if you start going star lucky instead of Starbucks, <laughs> then, then I mean, maybe it'll work in the short term. The long term, I think that just uh, to me, it just it's like a, a, a shrinking, a global shrinking plan. Yeah. Um, one of the things I always teach in my econ classes, and this is where quite often economists get head scratches from normal human beings, is that to an economist, the purpose of international trade is not to export. The purpose of international trade is to import, right? What you want to do is import as much as you can and export as little as you can. 
Mm -hmm. because it's imports that make your living standard go up and exports that make your living standard go down Mm -hmm. because what you want is you want more things and services these days and you only give up less and less in in return so the point of any country china the u.s whatever um limiting um imports is counterproductive it means you're going to make your economy poorer and the and the living standards of your citizens uh lower um so but i think you're right susan i think it's i think it's in on the part of the chinese it's both reactive to the wider world but it's also i think part of this resurgent chinese nationalism that's been happening for the last 10 years or so i, th- I think one of the time one of the first times i was on here i talked about the three different years or three different times I'd spent teaching in in Beijing and I was staying at a at a Chinese uh, hotel in fact it was called the auspicious business hotel right (laughs) Um, and I thought oh this is lovely and I was the only I was the only American in the place and so the TV in my room was only Chinese channels there was no Hmm. no CNN no you know, net Netflix, no nothing, and so and my Chinese is is non-existent. But so I ended up watching two or three channels. Now, what I watched mostly was the rebroadcasts of NBA games that would be on, hmm. just, even though I could tell what was going on. I didn't need the Chinese guy to tell me what was going on. And the other thing, he's on. And the movies were all the same thing. They were World War II or 1930s movies. And the Chinese were the good guys and the Japanese were the bad guys. Yep. And I didn't need to know any language I could spot. Having grown up as a little boy in Texas watching The Lone Ranger, I could tell who the bad guys were and who mm-hmm. the good guys were. And, and the good guys were Chinese and the bad guys were the, the Japanese. Now... If you know a little bit about Chinese history in the 1930s and the 1940s, the Japanese really were the bad guys. Yeah. The Chinese weren't necessarily the good guys, but the, but the Chinese were certainly more victims than, than perpetrators um, in that particular um, span of, of history. And then you go back a little bit farther than that to the, to the Boxer Rebellion and the British imposition of opium into into China and the various um, sections of Shanghai that were under the under the rule of, of European powers the mm-hmm. German concession and the French concession and the British concession where Chinese were either not allowed to go or if they were inside of the let's say, British concession in Shanghai, they were subject to British law in British jurisdiction, mm. and the Chinese, the local Chinese government had no say over that prosperous part of, of Shanghai. And that's, and that's only 100 years ago. Now, to an American, 100 years ago is the Dark Ages. I always, I always say that for my undergraduates right now, um, ancient history... Or the Middle Ages is the Obama administration, and ancient <laughs> history is the George W. Bush administration. Yep. And when we talk about Kennedy or Nixon or Johnson, they always want to know, was that before or after Jefferson and Lincoln and so forth? And I go, okay, <laughs> whatever, right? But for, for the Chinese, 100 years ago is, is modern history. That's today hmm. history. And yep. so I think, especially as Americans, since we are still the the biggest economy um in the in the world and certainly the most powerful military still um it behooves us to understand that other people big countries countries with um a history and some recent success may not be that comfortable with americans setting the rules for everything Mm-hmm. And so I think, Susan, your emphasis on this kind of overarching philosophy of the new plan 
is more important than the particular industries or the particular trade patterns that are that are in it. It's it's I I, I think it's more about historical retribution or renaissance, if you will, of Chinese civilization and their very proud people. But everybody's a proud people, right? Yeah. No, no, it's interesting. <laughs> it's, just that, a... it's just that the Chinese have a billion people to be proud, and that and that mm-hmm. that's a lot of pride. Now, now, a lot of people think that China sent the virus over to the U.S. And, and the, the logic is, okay, maybe, maybe not, who knows. But the thing is, why would they? Because that would destroy yeah. their economy, too, in the long right. run. I mean, the fact that yeah. we've gone down quite a bit economically really exactly. highlights that they've gone down quite a bit economically. So, exactly. So how much have they gone down, and what do you think really happened there? That's a good, that's a, that's a good question. Well, actually, there's several things. First of all, the, the, the virus that got to the United States didn't come mainly from China. It came from Italy, right? Because that's and, what some and, people and, say. Yeah, I don't know. Um, because but, that's, where, that's where the outbreak was before it hit New York. Right. right so the right. New York virus and the Chicago virus mm-hmm. came from Europe, primarily <laughs> yep. from, from Italy. Sure. Right? Now, where the Italians got it, the Italians probably got it from from China or mm-hmm. Asia. Um, there's good zoological and epidemiological evidence that the actual virus, which came from bats, right? And those and the bats weren't in China originally. They were in Vietnam and Laos and Thailand, in the northern parts of those countries. And I think I said this before. Um, Vietnam has been held up as a model case of how they're dealing with the virus, and they have very little infection and very mm-hmm. little death. Well, the, the answer may not be the Vietnamese government or the Vietnamese healthcare system. It may be that the virus has been in Vietnam for two or three or four years, mm-hmm. and now the the population has developed immunity. And yeah. when the bats got to Wuhan, and the other thing about bats, I know a little bit about bats now. Really from my sister in Houston who works at an animal shelter and one of the things they do is rescue animals and take them to some um, intensive care animal hospital mm-hmm. and a couple and I think last last week she had a possum right they'd found a possum somewhere that had something so they took it, whatever but about six weeks ago she had a bat and they were she was taking a sick bat that they'd found somewhere to this animal hospital. And I said, for God's sakes, hope it's in its cage. Don't touch it. Don't let it bite you or whatever, because that's, that's, where, the, that's where the virus um, hmm. came from. Um, now, China's gone down a little bit, um, but unlike the United States, I was thinking about this just a couple of minutes before we, before we started talking, before we went on, um, just came over the... I think it was Bloomberg News or something, but um, Mnuchin, the the mm-hmm. dingbat Treasury Secretary that our dingbat President put in office, um, has requested that the, that the Federal Reserve right now cease making payments to businesses and local governments as part of the CARES Act, and the Fed has responded by saying, "No, we don't want to do that because this money is still needed. The, the economy." is not doing well. In fact, today we got the new uh, first-time claims for unemployment, which were 50,000 higher than last week. Yep. Um, Mm -hmm. Well, you know why? It's year-end. All the accountants are laying people off again. Yeah. (laughs) I think it's more than that. Yeah, but it is more than that. Yeah. Um, And then um, in today's uh, Financial Times, Jamie Dimon, the head of Citibank, is complaining to Congress for acting like children and not getting their act together. And, and he said, one trillion, two trillion, get something done because we're in, we're in trouble. The, yeah. the benefit is, to China. I'm sorry, I'm sorry Ed, is yeah. Jamie is Chase or Citibank? I thought it was Chase. Chase, I, you're right. It is Chase. Mm-hmm. Okay. All those, they're all the same to me. It's right? about, they're, yeah. They're, <laughs> but you're right. Thank you, Rick. You could, yeah, it is Chase, right? City is somebody else. That's my bank. So I, anyway, okay. but yes, it's, it's J.P. Morgan Chase. J.P. Right? Morgan, yeah. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. Um, the one good thing about the Chinese system of government is that whatever the 
six or seven guys at the top, and Xi Jinping being the top top, whatever mm -hmm. they decide, they don't have to get, get it through a legislature. So they, they have a stimulus package. They have the People's Bank of China that's, mm. that's supporting the, the monetary system. I mean, fortunately, we have the Fed, but the Fed can only do so much, uh, and, it, and it has no power over federal spending and, and, right. and taxes. So um, the Chinese economy isn't doing as badly as, as we are, um, and um, I, I was looking at today, they're <laughs> also in the Financial Times. Everything I know, Rick, I learned from the Financial Times just about. But today, um, the, there was an article about the French luxury, good indus luxury goods industry, especially Louis Vuitton, Moet, mm -hmm. uh, Hennessy, LVM Ha. Um, 33% of the French luxury business is to China, and by 2025, <laughs> that will be 50%. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, and so the Chinese economy is keeping that part of the French economy alive, and the German automobile industry is not suffering too badly because Mercedes and Porsche and Audi are selling cars to China. Um, mm -hmm. un unfortunately, in the U.S., um, I happen to be a part of the leading U.S. export industry to China, which is higher education. Mm. Um, and because of our knucklehead president and the restriction on immigration and the anti-Chinese racism that we get from this China flu business and so forth, Kung flu and all of that, <laughs> Uh, that's that's have, it's being manifested by attacks on little Asian kids in elementary schools and junior highs across America. Um, a lot of a lot of universities that depend mightily on Chinese students because Chinese students pay full fare, and especially in places like Berkeley and Stanford and UCLA and USC, without Chinese students, those those places lose. 10 20 30 percent of their of their income stream um well, schools so too. yeah pardon state schools too and especially the research schools and especially research. state school yes mm -hmm. right you know, it's interesting because i know in the uc system here the university of california for a while we used to joke that it was called the university of china los angeles berkeley and everything else. they're not giving the Chinese students anymore any priorities. They've changed their mindset here. I'm not sure why, but so I'm not, I'm, they're not like wanted like they were before. So I'm not quite sure where they're uh, going with that. But that, that's may be, a, that may be true in California, but it's yeah. certainly not true anywhere else. Because no, but California is a weird place. So yeah. They're desperately needed in, in, the, in the, like Susan says, Look, the University of Illinois, the University of Wisconsin, yeah. Purdue, Indiana <laughs> University, <laughs> state universities yeah. that since um, since the 1980s, since Reagan became, well, mm -hmm. since Reagan became governor of California and, and president, one of his goals is to cut back on public support for education. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the state schools, especially with less and less support from the public sector have had to rely on tuition and especially foreign students and foreign yeah. students for a lot of state schools means Chinese students. Mm -hmm. So, um, although one of the things Rick that we sell to China and I actually Susan and I communicated about this is, um, chicken, um, oh, that's right. Breeding stock, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And yeah. they're, um, and I made the point to Susan that I that I sometimes make, but I, I fail to do it as often as I should. If if you want to pick the industry, the sector of the U.S. economy that is the most high tech, it's U.S. agriculture mm -hmm. because of because of the University of Wisconsin and the University of Illinois and Cornell and Penn State and the, the amazing. Like uh, yes. biology and zoology and plant genetics and so forth um, yeah. and it seems that at least uh, this is in the economist what i don't learn from the financial times i learned from <laughs> the economist but according to the economist what the chinese like what they're developing the taste for 
is the big white meat turkey chickens that come from the U.S. that you know mm-hmm. come from Tyson and yep. and the breeding stock for that is a very very closely held technological secret and there are only mm-hmm. two companies in the United States that have this secure lab that produces the special kinds of chicks so what we export to China are baby chicks right now my sister the animal lover probably wouldn't like that but we send little chicks to China that are going to grow up to be big chickens and then get turned into nuggets and and uh, <laughs> Kentucky fried chicken and so forth because along with as Susan said along with Starbucks um, McDonald's has a huge presence in in China. KFC <laughs> has a huge presence oh, yeah. in in <laughs> China. Um, yeah, and um, other. I'm trying to think. Pizza Hut. Because KFC and yep. Pizza Hut and Burger King, I think, are now all owned by the same. Are all part of Yum Brands, right? Oh, so, Taco ooh. Bell. Taco Bell. Then. Yeah, and Taco. Oh my God! Let's not forget Taco Bell. Taco yeah. Bell. I don't. Yep. I, don't I, I don't remember seeing much Taco Bell in in China, but that may be coming, right? And I don't think they have a lot of so, chicken at Taco Bell, so that's probably why. No, that may be it. Yeah. Well, here's um, another. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in there too. So we were talking about the five-year plan, and the, it, now I look at the investment priorities. The investment priorities are in agriculture. So they're wanting to uh, uh-huh. achieve efficiency. Second is in high tech. So they want to be um, known as the, the leader in high tech. And, and they're also wanting to do more like smart manufacturing. So they get away from the type of manufacturing that uses a lot of people. And that's getting outsourced to places like Vietnam. And, and we uh-huh. talked about this last time, Indonesia, Philippines. And, and, the, and the third thing I found to be really interesting is the initiative of, um, well, they go to be green by net zero by 2060. So uh-huh. very environmental, lofty goals. <laughs> but the other one is China's standards by 2035, to have the entire world on China's standards for uh, internet and um, any type of... Uh, <laughs> Are you talking about total censorship? Is that the standard, or or, or bandwidth? Well, the standard would be like like um, like oh, like the energistics or some of the like the data lake, data cloud. The data lakes, yeah. So it's more the bandwidth technology part of it. Yeah. And the bandwidth yeah. and how how you're structured and mm-hmm. the architecture. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Now, as a philosopher, theologian economic historian, Jesuit trained um, social scientist, Ricky used the right word, censorship. Yes. Where does real innovation come from? It, it doesn't come from five-year plans. If it no. did, then the Soviet Union would have been the highest tech country mm-hmm. in the world. Yep. Oh, and, they, and, and it doesn't come from stealing technology. Again, mm-hmm. if stealing no. technology would have helped you, then East Germany would have been the highest tech country in in all of uh, all of Europe or real Cuba. innovation real technological change comes from geeky guys and girls that can do what they want and aren't under the thumb of some state planner so what what the Chinese are doing in Hong Kong right hmm. is uh, establishing I was thinking about this when I was thinking about what we were going to talk about Rick and going back to my great courses course on capitalism versus socialism Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what what china has they have they're trying to have a capitalist economy in a communist political system right and and i think that's really eventually that's that's trying to square the circle because Mm -hmm. capitalism comes from real capitalism real market innovation in, in in innovation comes from intellectual freedom and openness Mm -hmm. and the ability to yeah and the ability to uh, be different right um and to be um kind of not unconventional that's the word i'm 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 looking for Mm -hmm. right um and so i i think and it may come from little things right um 
Bill Gates and, and uh, Paul Allen tinkering in their little dorm rooms in Harvard or Michael Dell tinkering in his dorm room in uh, Austin, Texas at the university or Steve mm -hmm. Jobs and Steve Wozniak tinkering in their in their garage, right? Yeah. Or my 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 personal hero hero Howard Schultz, right? Tinkering with his coffee beans in in Seattle, right? Um, yeah. And so I I I think what we should do in the United States is not do more planning or do more um, warp speed, right? Um, the the uh, Pfizer vaccine, which really isn't a Pfizer vaccine, it's a BioNTech vaccine, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. came from two Germans. Actually, they're not Germans. They well, they're Germans now, but they were they were the children of Turkish immigrants in mm. in Germany, and they and they started their own little company because nobody believed in their messenger RNA idea about fighting. Originally, they started. Uh, this research to fight cancer, to fight individual cancers. But they eventually got a little bit of money and um, were given the, the freedom to do some development and research. And, and that's, how they, that's how they came about with this, what really looks like a great vaccine. Because from my understanding of messenger RNA technology, unlike Say when I got the polio shot, what what they were doing was injecting me with a little bit of polio, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and hopefully that the body would produce antibody. What the what the BioNTech slash Pfizer vaccine and the and the uh, Moderna MR vaccine, yeah, is is mRNA. So it's it's sending a little messenger, sending a little signal into your body to tell the cells in your body to start making antibodies. Um, and so there's less side effect, less probability. But my point is that didn't come from some big government uh, planning uh, agency. Um, it came from a couple of people being unconventional, right? And that's kind of where America led the world and hopefully still leads the world right it's alexander graham bell messing mm -hmm. around in his in his lab or you know you, on and on of i would uh, even, yeah i would even argue that the u.s um a tendency to have consortia in in universities and and doing re research that way was somewhat okay but it was also equally stultifying because it just ended up with a a thesis, or and it and it was like a it was like a plan because the companies were subsidizing it yeah. and outsourcing their I, stuff, and it, and it didn't have enough freedom. That's a that's a good point. I I know enough about professors and, and to know that they're an idiosyncratic bunch, right? And you have to just let them do what they want to do. Now, ninety nine percent of the time, it'll be it'll be wasted time and <laughs> foolish effort. But the one percent of the time, it will produce, you know, the sock vaccine or uh, the internet or whatever. Um, so it's you know, research is messy. It's 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 not profit and loss. Um, it's not something corporations do. Now corporations can take basic scientific inventions that some professor fooling around. Uh, figures out and and professors i may get shot for this susan but professors really don't want a lot of money most of the time what they want is just to be left alone and to fool around doing what they want to do now i said 99 percent of the time professors fooling around doing what they want to do is just a waste of time and money right but you don't know what that is until after the fact um yeah that's so, so true it's just well, it's just basic yeah. basic research that you fund a department or a school of animal husbandry or microbiology mm -hmm. or something and <laughs> just let them work on problems. Now, now let, me, let, me, let me ask you, Ed, yeah, what do you think about this? Yeah. Soviet Russia lasted about ninety years, ninety nine years. It was, right. it, and then yeah. it died. 
Right. China is going on about what is it, seventy five, eighty years of um, of communism yeah, 40, right now. Forty nine. So it's seventy one years. Seventy one years. Uh, yeah. When do you think that's going to end? Because nothing a, lasts I think, forever. I think um, we have just discovered the Rick Zanotti rule, right? Mm -hmm. So the Soviet Union lasted from 1917 to yes. 1991, right? Mm -hmm. That's um, 76 years, right? So if we, were, if we apply the Rick Zanotti principle mm -hmm. to China, they've only got about four or five more years. Yes, yeah, it's, right? it's over at that point. Yeah, I'm, I'm being a syllogist yeah. right now, but... <laughs> but um, listen, that's that's... You know, no more off the wall crazy than anything else. <laughs> anything else. I, I think, and one of the things that that you learn about Soviet Union or even before that, um, the German Democratic Republic, mm -hmm. is that it goes along, it goes along, and then it stops. Right? It's it doesn't fall gradually. It just all of a sudden mm -hmm. something something makes it pop. Right? And yeah. so it could well, be right it could be Hong Kong, it could be Tiananmen Square number <laughs> <Yeah>. two. <laughs> but at some time, um, and it could be in the next five years or ten years, it might be twenty. Rick, I I think we can say right now, I don't think the People's Republic of China will last until the twenty second century for sure. No. And I don't think it'll make the first half of this century. Yep. In its I in its present it. form. Well, how about the British Empire? What made it pop? Hmm. Um, well, it kind of what made it pop was World War One, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of ended the British Empire. <laughs> Reading a book right now, a new biography of Keynes, fantastic book. Of which one? New biography Zach, of what? Uh, uh, John Maynard Keynes. Oh, Keynes. Called okay. The Price of Peace: Money, Democracy, and the Life of John Maynard Keynes by Zachary Carter. He's a young reporter for the. Uh, for Huffington Post. Anyway, right now I'm uh, I'm in the 1920s when Keynes is quit being an advisor to the Treasury at the end of World War One, and the British Empire is beginning to collapse, and then World War mm -hmm. Two kills it off. Right. Um, yes. So and it Brit and and World War One was something again, Susan. That's something nobody thought about. Right. The the Serbian uh, whatever you want to call him, terrorist, nationalist, patriot, hero, anarchist, ass yeah. anarchist assassinates the Archduke, right? Here we go. We're back in Vienna. Right? I mean, it took place in, in Sarajevo, but it was the Austrian Archduke, the, mm -hmm. the <clears throat> pretender to the throne of Emperor or Kaiser, Franz Josef. And no, somebody thought, well, this is some little brouhaha in the, in the Balkans doesn't mean anything all of a sudden all of western and eastern europe is in you know killing 50 million citizens mm -hmm. and um that just happened out of almost out of thin air right well the, pre of the, the, pre the, pre the preconditions were there but it took something well, unanticipated to bring it to bring it down I guess so, but you know there was that serious anarchist movement, and you, you saw it in Proudhon, and and, and you also saw it in um, in Bakunin, and um, you know just the basic writers in, in Russia that were like they were definitely um, so you had like all the monarchies were really trying to crush and suppress and keep things tightened down to keep that because they looked at it as a real threat and they're all, they're always popping up. And, and I know this is like a, a weird thesis, but I wonder what it would have happened if Prince Albert's grand scheme to have everybody related so everybody would have peace had, had just <laughs> not happened because maybe that's the reason for it. They're all inbred and interrelated to interrelated. Well, I mean, the problem, the problem of any monarchy is that you run into the Don Jr. problem. By the third generation, you've got real idiots, right? And that was one of the problems. With it. Fortunately for the British, they they cut off the head of a Stuart in in 16, 1648, right? And limited the monarchy and had a much more kind of gradual decline, whereas the French had 
didn't do that until 1789. The Russians didn't do it until 19, 1918. Um, and it's pretty clear that the Habsburg monarchy <laughs> was, yeah, and the Spanish, they were, you know, suffering from the third generation or the fourth or fifth generation deterioration of mental capacity. Um, and and it's why that's why elected democracies are a better system most of the time because you're not limited to a certain clan or a certain family right i don't know look at our us the last what how many decades it's it's been yeah, we have, little we have, dynasties we have, of the same people yeah, we like, have, my uh, gosh yeah, yeah. right yeah, and bushes and, and bushes yeah. and, and yeah mhm it's kind of scary mm-hmm. yeah yes yeah. Anyway, well, we are, believe it or not, we are out of time. We, we have to have you back on to continue this because it's We haven't solved really all the world's problems just yet. But we have, created yet, but the Zanotti, we have created the Zanotti rule. We know that the, that the People's Republic of China has only, I think, 4.3 Four more five, years. And go. we're done. And, and at that point, and it's we're over. we're done. Right. Yep. Yes. And, and I, think it's, I think it actually has to do with, um, it could be Japan or Taiwan that brings them down. Could be. Yeah, could or be. Hong Kong. Could be Hong Kong. Yeah, or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be, it's going to get interesting. Uh, yeah. Or, or again, yeah. somebody yeah. shoots the Three Gorges Dam and we all go down because <laughs> nobody will have anything. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. You know, the, the world is a crazy yeah. place, so. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, we'll about and somewhat that. unpredictable. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm like, I'm just chiming in. I didn't mean to. Um the World Economic Forum, and they're talking about the Great Reset. Mm. I mean, that could take down China, too. That could put down everybody, for that matter, but that's another issue. Um, uh-huh. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. World communism doesn't strike me as a great idea. but <laughs> it's, not, it's, not a long-term, it's not a long-term solution. No, no. I don't know what the real solution is, but eh, we'll see. I guess we'll find out. Uh-huh. Yep. But anyway, hey, Ed, it's always a real pleasure having you on. It's always, you know, good stimulating conversation. So this is this is and the fun. time goes fast. Yeah. It does. It does. I was looking. It's almost 40 minutes we've been on. And, and it just goes. Uh, and we know we can go a lot longer, but then we lose the audience about probably halfway through. It's like, oh, I don't get it. What are we talking about? So anyway, well, appreciate you coming on again. Uh, and And Susan, as always. If you're watching the show, please subscribe, give us feedback, and and you can always post comments below if you want to talk and, and hear more from Ed or anyone else. Have a good one, everyone, and we're not going to be here next week, so have a wonderful Thanksgiving if you're in the States or wherever else you are. Enjoy life. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye, Rick. Bye, Thank Susan. You. Bye. Bye.